Hi, everyone. This is Sima Lieberman, the inclusionist with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, where we bring people together across race to have conversations about race. If you've ever wanted to have a conversation about race, but were afraid to do so because you were afraid of either saying the wrong thing and being attacked or being ignored or trivialized, then this podcast is for you. Having a podcast, listening to podcasts will never cost you any money. It's always going to be free. But putting together a podcast does cost money. So to that end, we've created a Patreon account. And if you'd like to help support our show and keep us going for as little as $3 a month, please go to www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash race convo, convo like conversation, and subscribe to our podcast. I am so excited about my guest today. His name is Michael Mata, and Michael is the regional manager of Mayweather Boxing and Fitness. But what's really interesting about Michael is his cultural background and also that he is from the Bronx like me. And we had a really good talk about being from the Bronx. So Michael, how are you today? And why is it important to talk about race? I am great. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, and I think race is always a good topic to discuss um, because it's, first of all, it's a talking point across you, the world, you know, in every, in every bar room, in every barbershop, in every school. Um, I'm constantly having conversations with my son who is multiracial and uh, trying to figure out where he stands in the world. Uh, I think people, uh, still um, categorize or miscategorize or um, stereotype people because of backgrounds. And I'm, a, I'm somebody who has fought against that my whole life. So could you talk about your background? And I need you to just speak up just a little bit because it's you're a little low. No problem. Okay, I'll, I'll raise my voice. Is Close that better? Mic. Is that better? Is that yeah, better? A little better. Okay. All right. Okay, go ahead. Let's see if that, that should work. How's that? Yeah. So, so, talk, tell, so tell us about your background. I am, um, <laughs> I'm kind of a, a man for all nations. That's what we called me growing up. Uh, I am a black, Hispanic, and white. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of African, um, Cuban, Irish, Sicilian, Jewish, I'm um, just about everything. So, uh, you know, it's, it was interesting growing up in the Bronx. And at that point, by the way, I didn't even know that I was Jewish because I was raised on the black side of my family. Uh, I was raised by my mother's side. Uh, my mother, uh, who by the way, was a, uh, a featured model. She was in Jet and Ebony and all of those magazines in the sixties. Um, she identified as a multiracial uh, person and I was raised by her and my grandmother and my, and my two aunts. So four black women raised me. Um, my step-grandfather, my, 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 my traditional, my, my paternal grandfather was um, Cuban and Jamaican and black, um, but he lived in Queens and I saw him, you know, periodically in the summers for a month at a time. My step-grandfather was from Puerto Rico so I grew up in a house of primarily black women and a step grandfather from Puerto Rico who was never in the house. So um, everything I really became, the man I became, um, my morals, my values, my work ethic uh, were all, you know, grounded into me by my grandmother, who was a black red bone woman who grew up in Harlem and whose parents were from South Carolina. Um, and she really experienced a lot of racism growing up. So, uh, you know, in my household, it was about being a strong black man, despite the fact that I was a strong black Hispanic white man, <laughs> you just had to be a strong black man. So I, um, I really, I really bought into that and, and I, and I live that way at this point. So I, I see myself as a man for all nations, but I definitely identify more with being black than just about anything else. Okay. And how did, so how did your background impact you like in the neighborhood and also in school? I had a difficult time. 
I mean, as soon as I left the insulated uh, safe house from 800, you know, 842 East 227th Street in the Bronx, which is the East Bronx, um, I, I was kind of persecuted. Once I left the safety of my block, because my block was like the most amazing melting pot. You had black and Hispanic and Italians and Jews and everybody living harmoniously on this block. But as soon as I left the block, you know, the ghetto surrounded me. There was, a, you know, there was pieces of the ghetto in every direction. Uh, when I went to the left, uh, you know, some of the black kids would bother me. When I went to the right, the Italian kids would, you know, uh, attack me. When I went to school, um, you know, people were always asking me, so what are you? And I'm like, I'm a boy, you know? Well, what are you? What's your ethnicity? I'm like, and I'd go into that. And then I'd be make fun, made fun of. Because at that point, I was this little blonde-haired boy. Oh, yeah, blonde, blonde hair. Haired, okay. I had blonde hair. Blonde-haired, hazel eyes, um, very small. You know, I wasn't even five feet until I was in high school. Um, I wore glasses, so they called me four eyes. Uh, you know, I was, the, the Jamaican kids called me gray man because I was neither black nor white. The white kids said I wasn't quite white enough. The black kids were like, well, you're not quite dark enough. So I ran into um, issues all across the board. You know, so, uh, I mean, whether it was me getting into fights, um, we estimate that I had 400 fights growing up. You 400 know, I was fights? Yeah, on the street. I was bullied. Yeah. I was bullied a lot. That's part of the reason I started studying martial arts and boxing and all the different things, because I got persecuted. I mean, I, I, fought, I fought so much in my grammar school, or I fought so much in my public school, which was PS21, which was on 226th Street, that my family moved me out of the public school into the Catholic school. And as soon as I went to the Catholic school, I got just as many fights in the Catholic school because the kids were persecuting me. So um, I'd say that my, um, my history was filled with a lot of that, my early history. And how'd you find out you were Jewish? Well, that's a funny, interesting story. I mean, I, I grew up, you know, like I said, with a black grandmother, and she was black and white, but my grandmother identified with being a black woman because if you're black in America, especially in the 40s and 50s and you're brown skin, you're black. Whether yeah. you have this much white in you or not, she was a black woman. Um, I went to Brandeis University. So I, I, you know, I received a full scholarship to Brandeis, well, three quarter scholarship to Brandeis University. And um, it's funny enough, I was dating, you know, women from all over the world and I dated several Jewish women. And my grandmother was always like, Michael, why do you date outside of your race? And I'm like, well, I, I never see, I never see people in terms of color. I always saw people in terms of who they were. I understood her experience of it because her experience was she was persecuted. She was, race was always targeted on her. She, she was so mistreated. It was so hard to be a black strong woman growing up, you know, growing up the way she did. And I understood her struggle. Me, I just saw people as people. Um, so to answer your question, I found that I was Jewish two years ago via ancestry. I went wow. to Granite University not even knowing that I was Jewish. And it's an 85% Jewish school, university. Right. So it's hysterical that I ended up going there without even knowing that I was a Jewish, that I was Porsche, you know, 51 and a half percent European Jew. That's what 51 ancestry 51 and a half back. percent? Yeah. So that's what comes back on ancestry. Um, I found out that, you know, I went on ancestry looking for my father because I'd never found my, you know, I've been looking for my father my whole life. Uh, and I've had different stories of who he was and whatever. And while I was on Ancestry, I found my sister. I found that I had a sister that was also looking for her father. So we both have the same father and different mothers. Um, and of course, my sister's black as well. And she lives in Long Beach. So we banded together to try, you know, try to find our father. And we did. Uh, challenge was when he did find out that we were, um, when we did find him, he... Um, he wasn't happy that we found him. Or let me be clearer. The other kids that he had, his other children, were very unhappy that we found him. So it made it very difficult for us to create a relationship with him. Um, we, we spoke to him two or three times on the phone. He lived in Paris uh, and he was a musician. He played with Lou Rawls. He was a musician and it made sense. My mother told me that my father was a musician and he was. Wow. Um, and you know, we talked to him a couple of times and sadly uh, he had a heart attack and died. Uh, two months after we connected with him for the first time. So we really don't have a lot of closure other than we believe he's our father. He wouldn't take a DNA test. We don't have any more information than that, but we're pretty sure based on all the evidence that he would have been our father. Wow. 
And it was and was he Jewish too? Yeah, he's French. He's Parisian. Uh, Parisian, hundred uh, percent European Jew, Ashkenazi Jew. Wow. You know, I recently had on my show. I mean, like, I think the last show I, I posted, a man named Michael Fosberg, who is a, uh, who's he's an he's an actor, and he didn't know till he was thirty five that he was black. Because his mother was Armenian, his father was his, his, the stepfather, or whatever that he was raised with was was Swedish. And nobody ever told him that he was black. And then when his parents got divorced, he went looking for his father and found his father. And his father, his father was black. And he thought that he was only one of two white people on his basketball team. Oh. And then he found out that. No, he, there was really only one white person on the basketball <laughs> team, but he'd always hung out with a lot of black people, you know, and he finally, he said, oh, that's, he finally realized, that, oh, that's why I was so connected, felt so connected to, to black people, because he was black. I've well, always felt connected because I grew up in a, an environment where, like I said, I had these four women, I grew up around soul food and, you know, um, very traditional um, black family, um, you know, gatherings. And but you knew you were uh, black. You always knew you were black. Always knew I was black. Um, but I was light. I'm the yeah. lightest person in my family. You know, my mother and I are the lightest two people in our family. So it was always clear that I had probably a white father, you know, yeah. or a mixed race father. And uh, and then I found that out. You know, fifty five years later. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, so I'm 57 now. So I found out much later in life. Um, and you know, it, you know, my son's mother is um, is Jewish. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, and and my son is uh, is all the things I am plus that as well. Uh, I never see the world in terms of color. I see it in terms of color from the standpoint. If you ask me a question, I'll answer yeah. it but I never break down things based on someone's ethnicity or someone's you know, gender or someone's sexual orientation. I always thought that was beneath me. And if you had met my grand, my step-grandfather um, who was from Puerto Rico, imagine Archie Bunker meets George Jefferson, meets Chico and the man, the man from Chico and the man. Every, the, the, everybody was some slang version of who they were you know a white person was a honky a black person was that name the hispanic name was that name you know and i always told him i was never going to be like him uh because i just i didn't want to fall prey to that kind of stereotypical um system you know and and that's kind of where i am and how did you end up on the west coast well, in, you know, I, you know, I graduated from Brandeis University um, and then spent a couple of years doing weird jobs, like being a general manager of a couple of Texaco gas stations and um, working at a video dating service as a telemarketing director. <laughs> you know, I mean, we won't even get into my story, my history with uh, that kind of thing. But I went back and got my MBA from, Brand from Boston College. And when I graduated from Boston College, I always knew that I wanted to be in the record business. Uh, I always felt an edge and you know a need for that. I mean, I, I play music. I'm not a good musician. I played a couple instruments. I was never great at it, but I always had a pretty good ear. Um, and I, you know, while I was in Boston, I spent a lot of time in the local clubs checking out new music and checking out artists. And I became friends with a guy named Charles Pettigrew, who was in a group called Down Avenue. And they won what's called the, the, the WBCM, which was the big radio station there, rock and alternative radio station in Boston. They won the Rock and Roll Rumble. And they received a you know, uh, a traditional, um, uh, they were signed by MCA. He then subsequently left and went to Capitol Records as a solo artist. And he and I remained friends. I'm like, Charles, I really want to get in the business. And he basically connected me to an a and person at Capitol. And if you know anything about the reggae business, that's a layered process. Let's just say over the course of a year, this guy and I communicated three or four times, finally met me, didn't hate me too badly, and, and then sent my information to HR and then over the next year and a half, I interviewed with Capitol Records or EMI um, Music for what was called a management trainee position. And um, I probably had four or five interviews, sent several different proposals. 
and at the last minute decided, listen, I don't really want to live in Boston anymore. Boston was a really hard place for me, a really racist place for me at that time. I had a lot of problems in Boston being multiracial. I suffered through so much there. I said, listen, I'm just going to drive to California. And my best friend and I, Ellen Saravis, who happens to be Jewish as well, <laughs> we, um, we, we, um, we drove across country um, and drove into Los Angeles the night of the Rodney King riots, April wow. 30th, 2000, uh, excuse me, April 30th, 1992. And uh, drove into the city and people were throwing incinerated trash cans at my Jeep while I was riding on the 10 freeway. Oh, and the Jeep uh, was, was like my, open? It was open, the Jeep? Well, the Jeep had the, it had the top on it, but you could stay with throwing yeah. things at the, the vehicle as yeah. we were driving five miles an hour because there was fire everywhere. Um, and we got to town and, you know, um, I interviewed for a job with Capitol Records a week and a half later. And three weeks later, I was hired as a management trainee and the rest was history. I spent 17 years in the record business. And then, so what made you leave the record business? Well, I worked for four record labels over the period of 17 years. And in the record business, there's only really one person at each label that did what I did. I was a senior national director of promotion. So there'd be one of me at every label. And at the point, at that time, when, you know, when I was in the record business, there were 125 labels. Now there's like seven, you know, yeah. real labels, meaning the major labels. Um, and I was very successful in the record business. I was, you know, I had a, I had a very interesting nickname. My nickname, my nickname was The Nightmare. Uh, because I was always up late at night working, you know, programmers and out at clubs and doing all the kinds of things you needed to do to get your record played, get your records played. So um, I love that business. But the challenge was I was working 85, 90 hours a week, sex, drugs and rock and roll everywhere. You know, it became um, treacherous for my health. Yeah. And uh, as the record business consolidated, um, I realized that I was getting pushed out. There weren't a lot of record labels left. I wasn't really interested in, in being a part of those labels um, anymore in the capacity that I was in. And I had to find a way to reinvent myself. And I did that. You know, I had to figure out alternative ways to make an income because being a promotion person with an MBA was great. But when you left the record business, people are like, well, what did you really do as a record promoter? You're a shuck and job guy, you're a sales guy. What are you? They didn't really understand what it was that I did. And what I really did was I spent a lot of time promoting artists that everybody in the world knows. But I promoted those artists before people knew them. So I, in many respects, was responsible for getting those artists on radio. That airplay created sales at the, at the, at the sales level. At the, you know, and I was responsible for breaking the Beastie Boys and Bonnie Raitt and Megadeth and Everclear and Radiohead and Snoop and, and Master P and all these other artists. Uh, you know, without somebody like me, those people wouldn't have gotten the kind of exposure they got. So I'm, I'm, to be honest, I was fortunate to be a part of their history. I wasn't the only person. and I'm not taking full credit for that. I was yeah. one of many, but I was somebody that was instrumentally involved in getting them played. Um, so I'm happy that I did that. But I'm also happy that I left the business when I did, because I think I would have died. Yeah. You know, I was just, it just was, it was so crazy, the amount of hours and the time. And that's the other thing. In the record business, it's also was really segregated. So going back to the issue of race, in the record industry, you have a black music department, you have a pop music department. And if you go to a black music department, the stations at black radio, you'd notice they weren't getting the same kind of funding that Clear Channel's pop stations were getting. Yeah. They weren't in the same areas. They had to operate a bit differently. And it was interesting that I, who was black and white, was able to work both sides of it. I not only worked urban radio, but I worked pop radio. Nobody else did that. There were very few black men or women who were given jobs selling or working uh, pop radio. It was interesting, it was usually white people. Um, I just happened to be somebody because of my complexion, because of the way I grew up and because of how they saw me, it's like, oh man, we can, we can just drop you in here and you'll be, sad, you know, you'll be um, successful. And I was, because I grew up the way that I did. Yeah. And I saw it from both sides of the playing field. But I also realized how racist it was. And that bothered me too. What do you think about now in terms of, of how it is? In terms of, you know, because I know when people talk about urban music, they usually mean black music, right? 
Um, I mean, it's kind of a euphemism, but we, and we do have a lot of people, like a lot of crossover music, and we have people who like, um, who like work together. Like I really liked, um, what was it? Kendrick Lamar did Mad City several years ago with, oh, I can't even, oh, for some reason, I can't think of the name of the group, but it was that a white group. Um, and I thought that was, that was pretty cool. How do well, you, what, about Kendrick Lamar, Kendrick Lamar is interesting. He's a, he, well, first of all, Pulitzer Prize winner. For, I you know. know for music. And I, lo I love Kendrick Lamar. He's tremendous. Well, if you go to Europe, you know who opens for Kendrick Lamar? Who opens? Um, James Blake. Oh, James White Blake. Army. Yeah. Oh, so it was Imagine James Dragons. Blake. He did stuff with Imagine Dragons. With Imagine Dragons, That's Dragons what I like. right. So okay. James Blake, um, he's a prolific artist. He speaks of his way. He's also a very good actor, by the way, Kendrick. If, you, if you've if you never seen him, he was great in the Power series. He's tremendous. But um, what do I think of it now? Uh, I'm a purist when it comes to music. Uh, I evolve with the time, so I'm capable of listening to Drake, although Drake wouldn't be the first person I listen to. And there's no shade, you know, there's no shade on Drake. I just come from an era where I was around for the beginning of hip hop. I was around with Sugar Hill Gang. I was around with Spoon and G. Yeah. I was around with the Jungle Brothers. I was around with LL. You know, I, I saw that. Um, I'm really a hip hop guy that loves jazz. I'm a traditional jazz guy. So I'm listening to Miles and Cannibal Adderley and John Coltrane. You know, that's my style. So yeah. um, what do I think of the music today? I think it's hard for me to answer that because if I answer it, I'm going to sound like some old guy who doesn't love the new music, just like our parents didn't like our music and their grandparents didn't like their music. And, it, you know, it, it, I just feel like I like music. Yeah, me too. I like I, I, I'm obsessed with music. I love music. I like instruments. I want instrumentation behind me. Like. Yeah. Tribe Called Quest had a band behind them at points, and Farsight had a band, and The Roots had a was a band. And love the Roots, you know, love the Roots, yeah. love the Roots. Yeah. So you know, and De La Soul was fun. I don't oh, want to yeah. hear about you know bitches and hoes and all that. That doesn't work for me. I want to hear about real things. I want to hear about what's going on. That's why Kendrick is so interesting. I want to hear. That's why Saul Williams, who is a spoken word poet, I love Saul night, Williams. Yeah, was so interesting. And you know, I want to hear. I want to hear street poetry. I want to hear your experience, but I want it to be in, you know, I want it to be ingrained with music. I want to have, I want the music behind it, you know? So um, there are good artists now, but the business has changed. When I was a record promoter, I could physically go into a station and based on my promotional skills, based on the sound of the music, based on the fact that I had broken that song in another market and it had translated to sales, that artist, would then get the bigger play at a, at a San Francisco radio station. Now it's a big consultant that's working for 25 stations and that's programming from out of Atlanta that's programming all these different places. So it's not set up the same way. So the business has changed. I mean, you know, you're talking about, you know, old hip hop or old rap. I mean, like, I mean, I was around when Gil Scott Heron first started. My man. As well for, the revolution will not be televised. That's right. All you day know. and all night. <laughs> you know, I, and you know, I saw, I saw Gil Scott last... Heron many times, you know, many times. I saw John Coltrane either at the half note or the five spot. I can't remember. I saw Stanley Tarantino. I'm used to go to see all those guys, you know, and last week I saw for the first time, because I like old hip hop, yeah. you know, um, oh, you know, I love the Sugar Hill Gang. Mm -hmm. I love all. I love all. I love all those people. But for the first time, I heard Chub Rock. Now I'd never heard him before. I Chub really, Rock was great. Very fun. I, a lot of fun. Good dance music. You know. Yeah, he yeah. was fun. He he was great. He was at Stone Soul. You know, they had like the SOS band. Zap was there. Zap, Zap killed it. They must have changed their clothes like three times. I oh, mean, yeah. it was Zap that caused me to re-injure my IT band because I couldn't stop dancing while they were playing. <laughs> You know, Frankie Beverly, let us know. And Maze, and Maze yeah. in the house. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, and I really like, I really like all the old school, like um, with Jurassic Five. Well, Jurassic Five is interesting. So Jurassic Five and um, uh, Freestyle Fellowship and all those conscious rappers, conscientious rappers, they were big here in the 90s. Um, yeah. They spoke from their hearts. 
the poets, last poets, you know, lost poets and all the different, and Gil Scott Heron and that whole Watts movement. Um, Jurassic Five, those groups, and then at that point, the Black Eyed Peas, before they oh, had Fergie, the and again, too. no shade on Fergie, but they were hanging out. That was when I was bringing artists, I had Us Three, which was the first really, um, which is the first kind of hip hop jazz group to cross over. Remember the song Cantaloupe, Bitty Bitty Bop, the Bitty Bitty Bop? That was a record that I got played all over. Um, I would go to festivals with Jurassic Five and with Black Eyed Peas and Freestyle. And those groups always had such an amazing festival following, you know? So it was so, it was so enjoyable. Um, and the music was great. Jurassic Five was talking some real stuff. I really enjoyed the rap version of that. Um, I always wondered what happened to a couple of those cats because, oh, I also worked, if you remember Michael Fronte. Oh, yeah, he's, he's from here. He lives in several, yeah, I, met, I, met, I met him at a party. Well, he was in Disposable Heroes of, of the Hypocrisy which is an amazing group. If you haven't heard them, pull them up. Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy. They talk about the revolution not being televised too. Um, he's all, then he was in a group called Spearhead, which I worked right. when I was at Capitol. So, and Michael's a really good brother. Really good brother. So, you know, so there's a lot of, like, like I like atmosphere too. You know, I mean, there's a lot of real conscious rappers and then it became like a lot less conscious. And, do you think that racism played a role in what was being promoted? Like what, who was being promoted and who wasn't like people who spoke the most about, you know, B's and H's and all that other stuff were, seemed to be getting promoted more or do you think it was just what people wanted? Well, that's an interesting question. So it's more complicated than that. I'm not sure it's specific to that. I think there are three things involved. Got to have a hook. Yeah. Biggie, Biggie, Biggie had great hooks, right? Tupac had hooks. Oh, I, li I like Tupac because I met his mother in New York years ago. Right. They have hooks. Jay-Z had hooks. So yeah. Nas, you know, he came and he went. Nas was a lyricist, right? Yeah. Um, Wu-Tang, you know, they were the first to come out of here. NWA. Yeah, love them. A these, love them. A lot of these cats that are really good, number one, you never get to hear them. Yeah. They never get discovered. You see them on the street and you're like, oh my God, I've never heard anybody like you. But if they don't have representation, it's almost impossible to get your record played. You can, they, they can go around to 50 different you know, clubs and hand it to the DJs and the DJ will start playing it. But unless people are calling the radio stations and asking for it, it's gonna be hard to, to, to get that music played over an LL Cool J who's got a major arm behind him and marketing dollars. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's not as simple as, they're not getting played because they're black or white. I think they're not getting played because of dollars and cents. The haves and the have nots. Now we can get into whether or not blacks have less, of course. Well, Starting I a school system. I mean, we can go that any way you want. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but I think, you know, black people in general, you know, if you go to a schools in certain areas, look at the books, look at the teachers, look at the student to the teacher ratio. And not just black, black, Hispanic, people of color, yeah, brown people, you know, yellow people, all of us. It's, it's, it's hard to, um, if you don't have the opportunity, if you're not given the keys to the kingdom, you can't walk into that kingdom. So you don't get the same kind of options and opportunities that others get. So I think it's more than just being black or white. I think it's more about status. I think it's more about, um, it's almost like a caste system. You know, uh, that's how I look at it. But then there's the thing of like, who has status? I mean, if somebody is really conscious, are they gonna have the same status as somebody who's not? And because what makes me think about that is I think about how like a lot of white kids in the suburbs, they always have all the white kids in the suburbs buying a lot of rap music. Are they gonna buy something that's really conscious? And also I think about that, that you know, a lot of these kids will like listen to the music and not care at all about people's experiences or where it comes from. I mean, I guess you would call it cultural appropriate, you know, cultural appropriation or Correct. or cultural thievery, whatever it is. But you know, they'll be like they'll be they'll be rapping right here while you know they're you know you know while while they're killing black people. 
I think there are conscious rappers that are out there. Common's a con- conscious rapper. I, lo- I love Common too. I mean, because I, I listen to all the, all these people, yeah. You know, I mean, um, Black Thought from the Roots. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I can go on and on. There are hundreds and hundreds of conscious rappers. Um, if you remember, what was the alphabet rapper called? Um, it was an alphabet rapper. Um, try to recall um, that rap using the alphabet. And his wordplay was amazing. Um, again, when are they going to get played? Yeah. Where are they going to get played? You don't have the outlets you used to. MTV raps and all that, that's gone. All those underground shows are gone. So the way it's working now is radio doesn't even lead anymore. What leads, are, you know, people are mass distributing their own music. So you can get, you can get what you want. You're just not going to get it on the radio per se. You're not going to get it via TV. You can get it on Spotify. You can yeah, get it on YouTube. YouTube. You can get on you can get on YouTube Music. You can get it on you know Amazon. SoundCloud. Yeah. You can get all of those places. You can find these conscious rappers. You just have to look harder for them. It's not it's not at the it's not as simple to get there as you might. But again, radio is filled with the same songs over and over and over again. Oh, I know. It's just, it's that's what pop song. music is. How many times can you, that's how it works. You get played hundred dollars a week, you sell a million records. Now it's a million streams, you know, but I, I think you can still get your needs met. You just have to go about it in a different way. Yeah. And I'm curious about you talking about your son being really multicultural. How mm-hmm. does that impact him? I mean, is he like, cool? Hey, I'm cool with any culture. Cause I got so many cultures. Or has he had to, or has he had to deal with any issues? I think he's trying to figure it out. Yeah. I think that he is um, going through an identity crisis. He's 16. I'm not going to mention his name. I don't want anything to, you know, I want to keep him, I want to keep him insulated as much as I can. Uh, I think that the question of his blackness is out there. Yeah. You know, we live in an area in the South Bay where it's not very black. The South Bay of what? LA? South Bay, yeah, South like Hermosa Beach, Long Bay. South Bay here is like San Mateo. Yes. Correct. Correct. So it's not like um are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, cuz you went you got kind of lost you for a second. Um South Bay, so you know, uh, Hermosa Beach um redondo he goes to school in that area um when you're not around a lot of other people of color your experience is um shaped by that yeah you know i mean white kids love black culture but that doesn't but mean they don't want to be discriminated again but right? that doesn't mean they they're not that racist part of it. but that doesn't mean they're not racist that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. I always go back to the movie Do the Right Thing. And do yeah. the right thing that Spike, he, you know, Spike has been interesting to me, but that particular movie dealt with the issue of race in a really unique way. If you remember the sequence with John Turturro when he's talking about and this and that, but Magic Johnson, he's not black. He's more than black. Because Magic Johnson had crossed over to a white population and he wasn't seen as intimidating. Right. Even though he's a big black man. Right. I think that the same thing happens in the school system. These kids are reciting these black, these rap lyrics and using the and, and misusing the words and using the N word when they shouldn't be allowed to use the N word. And they think it's OK because it's promoted that they can do it. They have no idea and they're not connecting with it. They don't necessarily even understand the history of that word. Yeah. And that's difficult for me. So I'm constantly trying to have a conversation with my son, you know, who's like, well, you're not dark skinned dad. You're light. How can somebody tell you're black? And that's something I grew up with. Well, does it, do people really know you're black, Michael? I said, I'm black on the inside, right? I don't think it really matters what color I am because black people come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, all right? Yeah. I, you just froze for a minute. I, just lost I identify with what I identify. My aunt is my 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 best friend. Yeah. And if you asked her about me, she'd say I always identify with being black. 
even when I was persecuted, because yeah. it didn't matter, because I knew my grandmother who raised me, she really taught me to believe in myself and to be a strong Black man, right? And I carried that with me everywhere, and I still do. And I still hear this nonsense, well, you're not dark enough. I don't want to hear that, because I don't want to hear about being dark and light and this and that. First of all, it's stupid. It's just beneath, it's not even worth the conversation. But second of all, everybody's experience is their experience, right? That's right. I grew up in a house that I grew up in in the Bronx, eating, you know, um, chicken and in, in, in vegetable oil and grits and, and, and eggs and, and steak and eggs and, and, and ribs at night at four o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. That's the house I grew up in. Yeah. I love that I grew up in that house. And I love the family that I grew up in. Um, I wouldn't change it for anything, but I also know that because I grew up in that house and that I went to white schools, I went to a white grammar school, I went to a white high school and I went to a white uh, college and graduate school. And I was always one of few. But, you know, I mean, and the, the whole, you know, the whole colorism thing too, is in so many different levels, you know, like inside the community, outside the community. And then, you know, it's like, who gets put in prison? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. I was had somebody who was a, a therapist. And uh, we were talking about that, that, you know, like if there's like a drug issue or a domestic violence issue, the white person will usually get sent to rehab, you know, or to therapy. Yeah. The light-skinned yeah. black person might get a year, but they're still going to prison because they're still black. The darker you are, the more time yeah. you get, you know. So I find that really interesting because like white people are, are less threatened by people who are light skinned, but they're still black because remember the one drop rule, you know, when they said who was one black, drop it's rule. Like just one, one drop, that was it. Well, look what happened today. I was stopped by a policeman. I just had, we had this conversation. I got a ticket. I haven't gotten a ticket in over 15 years. And they said, I rolled through a stop sign. I had my hands on the steering. I'm like, oh my God, let it not, let's make it, let's be careful. I'm in Redondo. I'm a little worried. It was yeah. a Hispanic police officer. I felt less concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you as it is, right? Yeah. I was, I, I would have been concerned. Although sometimes people internalize some of the, you know, messages. I would have been more concerned. I'm yeah. not saying I don't need to be less concerned. I'm just saying that was my immediate reaction. I was like, hands on the, you know, on the dashboard, face straight up. Yes, sir. No, sir. No lip, no anything, because I'm not wanting to be a statistic. Now, I'm not saying I would have been, and I'm not implicating Redondo Police Department. I'm not saying that, but I'm just telling you what my physical experience was when I was stopped. Yeah. No, I know. I, I you know, and I, and I know a lot of times that when you're light skinned, you still have to deal like with, with white people saying really stupid stuff. Like, uh, well, gee, I wouldn't even know you were black, you know? What are you? Yeah. I mean, my, you? My, you know, my late partner that I was with for 18 years was black and light skinned. And I remember somebody coming up to me one day and saying, well, I wouldn't even know she was black. She's black. I said, well, she's black. I mean, she's black. I have make no mistakes about that. You know, and every day of my life, still to this day, I hear it almost on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a good one. You're one of the good ones or I wouldn't know, or you, you know. speak well. Yeah, you speak well. <laughs> You're articulate. Oh, you went to a good school? Oh, wow. You ever been in jail? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I have not. But um, <laughs> I, it's just everywhere I go. You know, I work for Mayweather Boxing and Fitness now, right? And I like that I'm in a position uh, where I'm a regional manager and can hire people because I hire people based on who they are yeah. and what they can do and what they bring, not what color they are, not what gender they are, not what, you know, what uh, the religious background or, or, or the sexual orientation. I don't care about any of that. If you come to Culver City's Mayweather, you'll see we're a coalition of everyone. We're, we're here, you know, and we, and we love being this, this, this family you know, this, this community, and we want people to feel comfortable. I want them to feel that way because I know what it's like not to feel that way. <laughs> I know what it's like not to be accepted, to be made fun of, to be persecuted, to be bullied. Um, 
I know, you know. And that's how it's, I mean, that's how it should be. I mean, that's why I do my podcast. That's why, like, I, I, you know, I call myself or other people started calling me the inclusionist because to me, inclusion is the most important thing and to be able to be included and bring your whole self, not to be included because somebody thinks you're not really blah, 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 but that you could bring your whole self. I mean, race is actually a social construct. I mean, when you look at this, really no such thing physically right. about race, but it becomes a, it becomes a social construct, but it's a social issue because of how people deal with skin color. Yeah, but it's also fear. Oh, oh. it's oh, always about fear. People don't yeah. understand, so they fear and then they persecute, yeah. right? Um, I have no fear of anybody. I go, you know, I've gone to Mexico, I've gone to Europe. I never think of anything other than, let me just indoctrinate myself in the culture. Let me see what this feels like. Let me experience the culture in a real way. Like when I go to Mexico, I'm not trying to hang out in Cancun. I want to be in Zihuatanejo. I want to be in, in the city. I want to be, I want to experience it. Um, you know, when I go back home now, Harlem is different. It's completely gentrified. Um, I've not been, you know, I have not been to, I said to somebody, I go, I haven't been to the gentrified Harlem because one of my friends was black said, hey, let's go to New York. And I, and she said, you know, we'll go to, you know, we'll go up to Harlem, we'll go to Brooklyn, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, you know what? I said, I haven't been to gentrified Brooklyn and I haven't been to gentrified Harlem. I think it would be kind of weird, right? It's different. It's just different. I mean, um, I struggle with it when it's pushing my brothers and sisters out of housing because they can no longer afford it. Yeah. That's how I look at it. But that's everywhere. That's in Cali. That's in New York real estate prices, rental prices are getting higher. So they keep pushing people out of whoever, whoever the people are, whatever race they are, they're being pushed out. And that bothers me because again, it begins at the beginning. If you don't have a level playing field, you're at a disadvantage from moment one. Right. I was fortunate enough to have a grandmother and a step grandfather who made enough money that I could go to decent schools and I could get the kind of education that allowed me to be successful and get an MBA and do all the things I did. I graduated high school 16, college at 20, I got my master's at 22 and a half. So I was able to do all of that because of them. There are a lot of brothers and sisters who aren't able to do that. Now, right. you can't just use that because you gotta, whatever you, wherever you're born, wherever you come, you gotta find a way, but it, why has it gotta be so much harder? <laughs> why is it gotta what? be so much harder you, for them? That is so, what you just said is so, is so right on. But you got to find a way, but why should you, why should it be that much harder? I'm watching a show on TV called 61st Street, which is an amazing show. Oh, what's 61st it about? Street, I'll watch it. Uh, it's about um, Courtney Vance plays a, a lawyer I and like his wife, uh, a politician. And this, uh, uh, this black kid who's a high school senior is graduating and he's got this college scholarship to run track. And he ends up in the wrong place in the wrong time and a policeman gets killed. And the story's about what's the system gonna do to him? And I'm also watching We Own the City, which is about the corrupt police department. I heard that is good. I heard that is really good. Yeah, they're both, they're both great. You know, I the wire, the guy who wrote The Wire, David Simon, he also wrote this. So it's- I like David both Simon great. too. And you know they're what? See, the Wire was one of my favorite shows all-time favorite shows and I was uh, reading something that you know they, they were interviewing David Simon and, and he said that his one one regret he says about the wire he said that the overall the writers were mostly all white and he said if he would do it again he would definitely have a lot more diversity in the writing right I mean I'm a screenwriter I wrote a screenplay called Club 24 which is about my experience running a gym in the inner city interesting how hard it is for me to get love on something that everybody's read that they love but I can't get it through now, I don't know what the reason is I know that I've created an urban comedy it's barbershop meets Friday in a health club and I'm having uh -huh. the hardest time in the world getting this thing done it's funny it's about a black general manager at a club in the heart of the ghetto working through some situations and it's funny I'm having all kinds of problems again I guess I don't know the right people that sounds like I would love to. I would love to see that show. It's funny. It's definitely funny. You know, I, again, 
the world again is not always fair, you know? Um, and I hate it when it's not fair because of color. Yeah. Or it's not fair because of race or, you know, or gender. I just, it's going to be hard enough as it is. You got to wake up every day and deal with $6 gas prices. You had to deal with Donald Trump. Wait a minute. And Mendocino is $10. $10. Yeah. It's seven here. Yeah. You know, they said, oh, gas is going up to four eighty. I'm like, four eighty. Where's the four eighty? I said, tell me where it's four eighty so I can go get gas there. It's like seven here. But I mean, it's, you're waking up to that. Yeah, Donald Trump creating all this diversion and der That's derision right. and and divisiveness and all this separation. You got all these things going on. Then you got COVID, you know, and then you got you know you're just in the rising prices of of, of houses and rents and rents. Right. It's really hard. People should just get over themselves, accept each other, and band together to make it a better experience for everyone involved. I really have always felt that way. You really got to just let all that other nonsense go. I'm telling you right here, I'm Black, Hispanic, and white, and I don't see it. I just, I'm, I'm who I am. I accept everybody. You know what I don't like? Stupid people. I hear you. I hear you. You know, I'm looking at the time, and so I have like three questions I want to ask you. Sure. sure. First, well, you already, I, I was going to ask, are there any TV shows or movies or films that you recommend? You just rec recommended two, right? We all 61st Street, We Got the City. Um, I mean, I watch a lot of great cinema. I'm a fan of movies and uh, I, I love This Is Us. Yeah. Because it talks about a family. Yeah. It's a beautiful story, you know, about how to integrate that world. Um, and it just ended. Uh, you know, I, 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 there, there are hundreds of things that I watch. It's really more about the genre, if you're asking me a question. I what, like what's science this? fiction and superheroes. I like to escape. Yeah, that's not that's not my thing. Uh, superheroes aren't really my <laughs> my 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 go-to. Mm -hmm. And neither is sci-fi. Mine are more dramas and comedies. Um, I like comedies. I like comedies. You know, I mean, I I thought it was a great show a few years ago. Uh, was it Friends? Um, the one the, that uh, uh, the key, Michael Key was on about the friends that all went to Harvard and they were all incestuous. I think it's friends. No, with... but I just saw another thing that he's in. I mean, everything I, called the Pentaveret. Everything, oh, he's Pentaveret? In, everything he's in yeah. is like, it's, you know, it's going to be insane. You know, it's going to be funny. It's going to be insane, right? You know, um, yeah, insane. I, there are a lot of great urban dramas. Um, but I would start with those I mentioned because I, those are the most recent. Yeah. And those are on and you can pull them up and, and, and I think they'll, they'll uh, keep you engaged. Second and, question. Yeah. Any books you recommend? Oh, The Alchemist. <laughs> you know, I love that book. Alchemist is great. Um, I read a lot of nonfiction, but uh, anything by James Baldwin, who's the oh, greatest yeah. writer of all time. Um, I also... I like the four agreements actually about love and so forth. Um, you know, I read a lot of self-help books. I read a lot. Um, I would tell everybody read some good books on nutrition. Okay. And taking right. care of yourself. I can tell you about all the great, uh, the great writers in the universe, but if you're not taking care of your body, which is your temple, you're not going to be around to read anything. That's so why, that's, work why, that's out. Why I like to work out. I mean, that's why I, I, you know, when I first talked to you, I was so happy. I go, yeah, somebody else is really, because, you know, I love working out. And that's the thing about the IT band injury. It's like, what? You know, so he finally said, if you don't rest, if you don't do what you do, you'll never work out. I said, okay, I will. Work out, work out four plus days a week. I don't care what it is. I like what I do. I run made with a boxing in Culver City. You could definitely come here and get a great workout and learn how to box. But it can be anything that's building, you know, lean muscle mass that's um, elongating your spine. Uh, that's, you know, that's allowing you to oxygenate your blood, all of those things. And you need to be able to make sure that you're eating properly. I've been keto. I've been vegan. I've been pescatarian. I've been special. Yeah, I do. I've had a lot of different ones too. I'm gluten-free, dairy-free, alcohol-free. And I don't drink, I don't eat red meat. And, and actually, and you know what? I'm 72 years old and people will say stuff like they go, Hey, I go, you know what? I take a lot of supplements and I work out, you know? Well, you I look do. great. You know. You're 72, I'm 57. Yeah. We've got it going on, you know? Yeah, that's right. We do. We, we got a lot more to do. And then finally, what what's on your playlist right now? 
Kate Renata. Kate Renata is a DJ. Kate Renata is ridiculous. Um, how, do you how do you spell that? K A Y T R A N A D A. It's a okay. very good uh, DJ that mixes some things. Um, I love. Um, I mean, I love so much music. Uh, Miles Davis, kind of blue, always. Uh, Christian Scott, an amazing young trumpet player. Check him out. Uh, and uh, I like Afro-Cuban beats. So any, I do too. Uh, you know, I can go on and on. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. If I'm listening to, I like a mixture of music, you know, that's where I am. And any last moment, like, well, I'm going to ask you, for your con, you know, like any social media, anything you want people to people to contact you, but also uh, in terms, because I always like to look at solutions. If you're gonna, if somebody said to you, well, you know, what can we do to end racism? What are some things you would say? I know it's, it's not a simple question, but got to start somewhere. Go a place you've never been before. Yeah. Go to a third world country. Go to India. Go to Africa. Go to Europe, experience other cultures, talk to other people, learn that we're all the same. We just have, we all have different experiences, but we're all the same in our core. You know, it, don't break it down to color. If you have to break things down to color, you need to educate yourself. Educate yourselves, read, read a black author, read a white author, read a female author, read a trans author, you know, read, breathe. And before you say something stupid, think, Ask somebody a question. Don't make judgments. Take your time. Well, this has been great. Of course, I could talk about you know music forever and fitness forever and race forever. Uh, so, if somebody wants to get in contact with you, what's your anything any social you want to tell people? Yeah, I'd say well, my you know the mottas, which is my Instagram, T H E M O T T A S. That's really Wait, just say that a, again. G the T H E Matas, yeah, M O T T A S, the Matas. Okay. Um, that's just my Instagram, but that's really if you want to see my son play basketball. My son is a really gifted basketball player. Um, he's a high school student, and hopefully, he's going to get a scholarship. He's a very, he's a, he's got all the height I didn't get. He's over six feet. I'm under six feet. So, um, in terms of Mayweather, Mayweather, F I T, Culver City, Mayweather Fit, Culver City. Well. Thank you so much. This has been such a great show. I mean, we'll have to do it again because I was like, you know, it's been so cool talking to you. Thank you so much. Any any one last word you want to say or anything like that? I can't I can't remember the alphabet rapper, but pull it up. Pull up is a rapper that raps about the alphabet. He's one of the greatest rappers of all time. I can't remember his name right now, but it'll come to me later. Um, the last thing I want to say is just I'm battling stage four cancer. And the reason I'm beating stage four cancer and I'm in remission wow. is because I eat properly. It's because I work out daily, because I don't harbor any anger in my heart, and because I am a living testimony to the fact that you can be black, Hispanic, white without a father, growing up in the Bronx and everywhere else, and I made it. And so can you. Thank you. Just so don't put yourself in a box.